pleased and honored to introduce Janet Robinson to you. She's a member of our fellowship and a friend. She was born and raised in Kansas City. She's already established there are several Kansans here and served in the US Peace Corps in the 1960s. An important choice in her life and one that continues to influence her involvement in Panama. Today we'll hear about the formation and continuation of the Forum Foundation, whose mission is to provide access to high school for students in Panama by supporting them with transportation, food, and housing scholarships. Janet's the mother of two, Kelly, who's right there, <clears throat> who leads the park board, and Bruce, who lives in San Antonio. Janet rejoices in having found our fellowship here and in the wonderful community she feels part of. And we're so happy to have her here. Welcome, Janet. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank Shirley and Martha for the beautiful flowers in my honor, and James for learning the Panamanian National Anthem. <laughs> which I recognized. Um, and uh, Shirley is my timekeeper because you shall see I can go on and on about this. <laughs> and I know some of you are going to the Queens for Greens uh, event today, so she's going to help me end if I carry on too much. Uh, well, as uh, said in the tickler uh, about my talk today, I j um, was in my fall of my senior year in college at Kansas State University, sitting up in my sorority room, and I apply for the Peace Corps. Um, I'm a young, idealistic, and earnest young woman, but I have never been any further west than Denver, any further east than St. Louis. I did have four years of Spanish, and my major was English and sociology. I'm not sure what I thought I could contribute in a third world country, but I was up for it. To my great surprise and joy, I get accepted. I hadn't told anybody, even my fiance. Then I tell him, he's in graduate school trying to avoid Vietnam, not because he's particularly scholarly. So he decides to apply, because the Peace Corps is also an exemption from uh, via service in Vietnam. So he applies, he gets accepted. In June, I graduate from college. In July, we get married. And in November, we're off to the Peace Corps training camp in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. I've already had a bigger adventure than I've ever had in my life. And we train. And then the following February, we are in our site in Panama. And uh, it's on the Inter-American Highway, about three hours west of Panama. It's the capital of that Cocle province. And there's the paved road that goes through town, the Inter-American Highway, <laughs> and one other paved road. But I do m much more than most of the other Peace Corps volunteers. I have running water <laughs> and uh, electricity, so I was blessed. So at the end of the first week, uh, as we've kind of settled in and gotten furniture and gotten organized, it's time to do the family laundry. I take my newly acquired laundry basket <laughs> and pile our clothes in and go down to the river to wash our clothes. Let me tell you, I, I don't have to tell you, that is hard work. And it takes hours. So, and I am the biggest attraction at the river bank that day because, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> they're, you know, it's a long, arduous process and I was something new. So we all start talking. And the woman next to me is being especially helpful, giving me tips and techniques about how to accomplish this. And we start talking. Well, by now, I have turned 23. And uh, I'm thinking she's between 35 and 40, um, because she has gray temples and lots of gray in her hair and has lost some teeth. And it turns out we are exactly the same age. Well, she's 24, and I'm 23. She, at this point, has had nine pregnancies. She has graduated from grade school. That's the end of her education. She gets married, as, but no priest or no justice of the peace or anything. But they move in together, and she's had nine pregnancies and has seven living children. This was a conversion experience for me. I can't tell you the impact. I thought, there, but for the grace of God, go I. 
I had been born in the United States to parents who valued an education, went to good schools. So in the 10 years that she spent birthing nine children and losing two, I've gone to junior high, high school, and college. My first conversion experience in Panama, I am a lifelong supporter of women's rights to choose <laughs> and of Planned Parenthood, something I continue to support to this day. And I'm a much more humble and grateful person. I mean, just because I've had this great good fortune of being born in the States. So then, uh, Peace Corps wasn't very organized in these days. When Kelly went in, they were a little more organized. They had job descriptions. We were just supposed to find something worthwhile to do. <laughs> so at the end of the first year, half of the group had already gone home. Uh, it's, for some, it, Vietnam looked better than <laughs> or easier than this. So uh, I set about trying to find something useful to do. And the Minister of Agriculture in this uh, is supposed to be our partners in our work in the compo. And they give us uh, seeds and fertilizer and some god awful protein powder uh, we, that we never could make taste good um, to us. And so I start up the road towards the mountains. Um, and I come to the first grade school and um, with my seeds and my fertilizer <laughs> and, and a wonderful school director there and we start a school garden and that goes well and we um, start a little Girl Scout troop and that's going well and she comes to me after a while and says Janet the USAID United States Agency for International Development has donated seven um, treadle sewing machines and they're in a warehouse in Panama, and they're resting, of course. This is Panama, hot and humid. And I've tried to get them, and they won't give them to me. You're an American. Let's go see if you can get them. So I don't even know how I do this, but I go and I talk them out of the sewing machines. They are rested. I get a bleep, bleep oil can and get them all running again. And uh, I contact my mother and tell her to send me patterns of children's clothes. And I bootleg these patterns with the national newspaper, La Prince, and make copies. And I start up the mountain. One of the ways I know I talked them out of this was that there are Peace Corps volunteers up there. And I'm going to distribute them where there are Peace Corps volunteers. So of course, I give the first two to the lady, <laughs> the, the school director in the first town. And I start up the mountain distributing these sewing machines. And at the very end of the road, further stuff in the mountain, are uh, John and Kay Keffer, who become great friends. And one of the reasons they do is because to get up to that last place takes half a day. And then we have the meeting with the women that we've invited. And you know, you go around and find them up in the mountains and invite them. There's no phones, there's no <laughs> You know, uh, or you and you put an announcement on the bulletin board at the t local tienda, and we get this little group going. But by the time we I get up there, we have the meeting and have lunch and visit and make our future plans. The last chiva has already gone down the mountain, so I have to spend the night on a pallet on the floor in their living room, <laughs> and. Uh, by kerosene lamp, all this is going on. They don't have electricity. So we become great friends because we have nothing to do but visit and get acquainted. So um, that, that friendship goes on and on and it leads to the Forum Foundation. So this is what I do my two years in the Peace Corps. And the women up there figure out, I think we're making children's clothes for their children. They figure out way ahead of me that they can take these little dresses and camisas and pantalones that they're making to the Mercado down in Panama, Panoname, and sell them. And these women have the first cash money they have ever had in their lives that didn't come from their father or their husband. It's huge. We don't have to go up and round them up for meetings anymore. They're coming by Kay and John's house and knocking on the door. Can I use your sewing machine? And it takes on a life of its own. And at the end of my two years, I didn't change the world, but <laughs> I got changed. And I went home, and I had Kelly, and, and had a family, and worked, and went on with my life. Well, John and Kay and I all stay in, in touch. They're from back east, went to prestigious eastern schools. John goes back and gets an MBA from uh, Carnegie Mellon. And he has an 800 number at Citibank where he works. So he calls me from time to time, and we visit, because 
long distance used to cost a lot of money. <laughs> And when he's traveling, he stops by. I've lived in Kansas City and Phoenix and, and outside of San Antonio, and we visit, and he comes over for dinner. And life goes on, but we stay in touch less than yes. He, he dates my sister. They fix up our parents who are widowed, and they have a fling. I mean, John and I just have some sort of karmic <laughs> tie in life. And so my sister keeps up with him better than I do by now. And by now, Kelly has gone off to the Peace Corps, and I'm so excited about that. I share that with him. And when, he, when I'm 60, he, uh, my sister calls me and tells me that John, had, who I knew had started his own business, had gone on to great wealth, no surprise to any of us who knew him, and um, has no children. So he has started a foundation. Uh, and he starts calling me when I'm 60 and telling me, let's go to Panama with money and we go off where we used to be and we can do great things. And I'm like, are you nuts? <laughs> I have a business, a family, a grandchildren by now, and I have a mother in long-term care in my town. So John is nothing if not persistent, and he calls me about every six months and encourages me to think about doing this. So and when I'm turning 65, there are some big changes going on in my life. And he calls me and says, Peace Corps is about to have their 50-year reunion, 50 years they've been in Panama, in Panama City, and let's go. And I said, well, I'm, that kind of sounds fun, because some of our friends are coming back as well. But I'm only interested in going if we can go up in the mountains where you know we worked and, and see what's happened up there. So we agree. And we go off in November, I think, or October that year, 2006. And we go up. Well, the first big surprise is we're starting up the mountain. There's a sign there, a mileage sign that says Caimito, 14 miles. I'm like, wait. It used to take me half the day to get up there. But now there is a paved road. There's bridges. You don't have to get out and hike up your skirt and fort and get back on the chief. And so we arrive up there, and we pull up in front of the Martinez family store, and John gets out of the car, and somebody yells, John, you're back. And I get out of the car, Juanita. And they're all still there. You know, they have added their, built their houses one room at a time as they could acquire a concrete block. And, 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 it's just overwhelming. People are coming from everywhere to hear. They've heard we're there and to visit with us. The second night we're there, uh, they have a big party, a dinner, music, the whole thing to honor us and to welcome us. John gets up and makes a speech saying that he's found this foundation and he would like to do some good things in this community. What do they want? They want a high school. I mean, there is absolute unanimity. As you leave um, Panona May, the regional capital, there's only one high school in this huge catchment area. And, uh, and it's a Catholic high school, private. No public schools at all. So at this party, people keep coming up and telling me stories about memories they had of me and things that that in ways they thought I had changed their life, including the man who ends up with the original Singer sewing machine. <laughs> and he teaches himself to be a tailor, and he establishes business. Electricity finally comes. He acquires five more uh, sewing machines, and he has daughters, and they've moved into the middle class. He's making clothes, school uniforms, and everything. His daughters are there, and they're like patting me because they've heard these stories of one need to bring in this sewing machine. So my second conversion experience, I, right at this moment, I look over at John. He sees the change in me, I can tell. He says, I think you've decided to help me. <laughs> And so I went back to Texas, to Kerrville, where I was living, and did indeed make all the changes I need to make to be part of this. We're planning to go down every few months, and I stayed usually from 10 to 14 days. So we go back in February of the following year, and we hear that the Minister of Education is going to be speaking at a, another little village not too far from from Caimito, and we decide to go up. I think we're going up just to meet him and lay the groundwork. So we go up there, and I'm sitting with a group of women trying to improve my 
now very rusty Spanish, and uh, he makes his talk, and I see John go up and greet him. Well, this is the Minister of Education for the whole country, a cabinet-level position, and he speaks perfect English, most likely which educated in the States, and they keep talking and talking, and I finally I see them shaking hands and patting each other on the shoulder, and John walks over and says, we have a high school. <laughs> like, what? He said, I promised a school bus, an American school bus, 30 computers, and a printer, and he is going to send us the teachers for the first year. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I come down again. John can't always come because of his business. And um, we put in 30 computers with a young man from his company. And every day I'm there, people are coming by, bringing us food and showing great interest in the whole community. We have a meeting announcing the school. 400 people show up. There's no place to accommodate 400 people. And they stand out in the rain under umbrellas. I see that this is just going to be huge. And indeed, Moving right along, we, we do start a high school there. So, um, and I make a decision there that we are still carrying out today. When I see all the interest from people in the community, I say, let's hire an informatica teacher to do an adult ed class at night. I go down to the T and I put the announcement on the bulletin board there in front of the store about 10 o'clock in the morning when I've taken a coffee break. And by 4 o'clock the afternoon, it's full. <laughs> And we start the computer classes. And now today, we have seven computer labs scattered in these villages where, as electricity arrives up in the mountains, this year we're going to put in our eighth. And uh, we have the adult education classes. On one of my trips, a gentleman says, Juanita, Juanita, my son and I took your class. I have a job at the post office, and he has a job in a hardware store on uh, the cash register, which is essentially a computer these days. So I think this is working, and it has worked. We've been doing this since 2008. So the next thing that happens, we're up celebrating the opening of the school, and there's been parades and celebrations and everything. And we're sitting at this little cafe at lunch, ha having lunch, and this pickup truck pulls up, and there's eight adults in the back of the pickup truck, and they pile out. <laughs> And they said, we're looking for John and Juanita. Oh, there they are. <laughs> I mean, we sort of stand out in this small village. And um, they come in and tell us that they've heard what we've done there. They have a school quite a distance away. How they heard about this, I don't know. But anyway, and uh, they're outgrowing the school. The government has started three years ago the three classrooms they were promised, but they don't finish them. The cement and the zinc for the roof and the... The concrete blocks have disappeared, a lot of corruption there. And they're very frustrated, and they wonder if we would buy the materials, and they'll do the mano de obra, the um, work, the labor. Everybody in the compo knows how to lay block, believe me, and fix concrete. So they invite us to their town, and we go down and see the situation, and this is just you know, a no-brainer, OK. And they've chosen graduation day, so there will be lots of parents there to tell us, yes, indeed, we're going to help build this, and we will we'll finish it. So we're, there's refreshments, because it's graduation day, and we're about to leave, and this gentleman approaches me, and it turns out his two, these two very bright-eyed young girls next to him, turns out his daughter had graduated in Premier Poisto, the first place, and her cousin graduated in second place. And they want to go on to school, but he doesn't have the money to send them. So he asks if we would consider that. So I start chatting with them and find out that they can go to the they're too far from the high school we've started to go and come back in one day. But they can go to the Catholic school. And it's going to cost a dollar a day to send each girl. So $10 a week to send both young ladies. And then I find out in talking to them that they're going to get up at 4.30 in the morning to come down to the school to catch the chiva. So we throw in some money for a breakfast when they get there. And this young lady's name is Jasmine Soto. She plays big in the later story. And um, we use this model. Now, By now, the government has promised to build five high schools up in the compo. And as each one of them opens, I'm getting my signal. 
as each one of them opens, we follow them and we go around to the middle schools around there and we offer a transportation scholarship, a school uniform, and some money if they've had to travel really far for food. And so this five of these high schools are being built. Well, in, in 2000, last year when we're trying to make some decisions about the future of our foundation because John's health has faded, and we start quantifying how many kids we have helped go to high school. It's 2,000. I'm just like <laughs> blown back by now we've hired staff and this is all going on. So the first young lady that started, Jasmine, uh, has now finished high school. She try, gets up at two, early in the morning, travels, great sacrifice, and she's graduated with distinction. And she wants to go to nursing school. Yay. <laughs> and so I, say, I have two grandchildren going to college in the States. I know how much it costs a year to send a kid to a state school. I'm like, well, let's see. So I say, no, I'll be back in two months, develop a budget, bring Jasmine, and we'll talk about it. Well, it turns out in Panama, you can keep a child in college for about $500 a year. By now, the University of Panama and the Technological University have satellite campuses in Panonome in the regional capital. And so, and fortunately, Jasmine had family in Panonome. And so they agree to house her, and we pay a little extra to offset the burden that this is going to be. Well, now we have 274 kids in college <laughs> and uh, 15 college graduates, and one of them is Jasmine Soto, who is now an RN and a professional woman. Just you know, really thrilling. So that's my story. <laughs> And I started this work at 65, and now I'm 79. It's given me purpose. It's giving me joy. It's giving me a sense of being able to make a difference. Service is the gift, and the gift is to me for all of this. And um, unfortunately, John is in a memory care unit back east and doesn't always know, but I write him and send him pictures and as if he does understand, hoping at some level that he does. So what have I learned? I think of the saying of um, the United Negro College Fund, a mind is a precious thing to waste. And there are such bright, ambitious kids who want a better life up in those mountains. And we've helped. We've kicked open some doors and helped given them an opportunity. And they've shot right through them. <laughs> and they're grateful and kind. And when Kelly and I were there, many of them came to see us. What a joy. My 79th birthday was maybe the best of my life for that experience. So, um, and the other thing I've learned is, say yes sooner, Janet. Stretch yourself. Because <laughs> I, I tend to do that. Oh, I can't do that. that you know, that's too much. So I, I'm trying to get better at saying yes to Mary, who's asked me to do this speech. <laughs> I said yes. So thank you. Thank you, Shirley and Martha, for the flowers, and James for learning the uh, Panamanian National Anthem, and the love and support I always feel here. I love being part of this group. <laughs>